Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, well, hello. My name is Rashawn Allen. I'm the 2013 Military Youth of the Year, and I'll be serving as your Master of Ceremonies for today. Well, first, would you would you would everybody like to join me in giving appreciation to these to these kids from Southside Christian Child Care and Preschool from Louisville? On behalf of all of our sponsors and supporters of this event, I'd like to say welcome to each and every one of you to the 10th Annual Child Advocacy Day at the Capitol. During the day, you have the opportunity to meet with legislators to express your desires for their support for legislation in behalf of the components of the Blueprint for Kentucky Children. At this point, Dr. Terry Brooks, Executive Director of Kentucky Youth Advocates, please come forward with some, spe with some special recognitions. Well, first of all, we uh, really, really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, we had to make a tough decision today, which uh, this morning it was that you were either going to feel like sardines inside or popsicles outside. So, uh, so I hope you put up with the crowdedness, but uh, it's terrific that on this 10th Children's Advocacy Day, uh, we have more people here than can fit into the rotunda. So uh, why don't you give yourselves a hand for, uh, for that? Uh, this morning's rally really consists of two very different kind of parts. Uh, the first part is that we have some uh, leaders around each of the issues on the Blueprint for Kentucky's Children, and they're going to spend a few minutes talking to you about what they view as really critical issues going into the 2014 session. Uh, then I'm going to take just, I promise, five minutes uh, to go over some logistics with you, and then we're going we're gonna to send you on your way. Uh, I do want to make sure that folks know that at 1 o'clock today, we're having an event that we really need you to come back for. Uh, Governor Bashir has agreed to uh, speak around sort of his plans and priorities for kids. Additionally, uh, the governor, the first lady, and several legislators uh, are going to get recognition. And uh, we need to make sure that they know how many people were here today, uh, how many kids champions are here. So uh, I know a lot of you have appointments, uh, but we really need the rotunda filled at one o'clock today. Uh, our very first uh, item, uh, and, and I'm gonna start with a recognition and then let, uh, let the person being recognized bring some remarks. Uh, one of the things that we look at, uh, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more at the one o'clock rally, is what I would call uh, sort of cardinal virtues of, of leadership. And uh, the person that I want to recognize right now uh, would be uh, somebody who, in my opinion, has caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, it has not been a surprise, it's not a surprise to many of you that youth justice is an issue that has needed reforming for a long time in Kentucky. Uh, when you know that only Oregon and Texas locks up more children than Kentucky, for status offenses, that invites uh, fundamental reform. Uh, even though it's been on the docket a long time, it took some leadership in a bipartisan way uh, to make that happen. It began with Senator Jensen and the person we're gonna recognize. It's continuing with Senator Westerfield, but the consistent leader on this has been Representative John Tilley. So we've invited Representative Tilley to come uh, to give you the challenge that he sees but before we let him have the microphone, uh, I'd like for you to join me in recognizing him. Uh, this is a, I really like this instead of a plaque, it's an old dirty tennis shoe. Uh, and it says, thanks for going the extra distance for kids. Representative Tilly, thanks for going the extra distance for kids. Thank you. Good morning, kids. Good morning. You're good at that. Let me ask you something. What do you think is the most important issue we're facing this session in the General Assembly? Anybody? The budget? Roads and bridges? Child care assistance? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Right there. I think that's the winner. Let me tell you what I think the most important issue facing this assembly is. 
Nobody's agreed with me yet, but they will. Kids. Hey, kids, I want you to get ready for something. Thank you, yes. I think without question, that is the blueprint for Kentucky's success. Just four letters, kids. Everyone that has spoken so far about what is important has said budget, roads and bridges, on and on. But I think it's kids. And I'm going to ask you in a minute, and I want you to raise the roof on this place when I ask what the most important issue is facing us this session. But let me tell you why it's the most important issue. Terry alluded to it just a minute ago. Only Oregon and Texas lock up more children for status offenses. And let me tell you something, they call it detention. I'm a former prosecutor, and I thought it was detention. And that's what we call it. For those of us who have been to one of these facilities, there's razor wire around it. There are bars. Looks a little bit like, or just exactly like, an adult prison. So it's not detention, those of you who grew up in the 80s and watched The Breakfast Club. This is not Saturday morning at the school library, is it? It's prison. There is a purpose and a reason we have prisons. As a former prosecutor and as my co-chair in this effort, Senator Whitney Westerfield, who would be here right now if he could, would tell you as a prosecutor, we both fought those battles in the courtroom, there is a reason for prisons. But prisons don't exist to lock up children who've missed school. Can I say it any clearer? Prisons don't exist to lock up children who have missed school. I can't say it any better than Hassan Davis, and I know he would be here. He's probably here today. Where is Hassan if he's not? But during one of our meetings, he said something very early on that stuck with me, and I hope it sticks with you. The majority of these children who end up in prison because of status offenses or other offenses are dealing with issues at home that make it very difficult for them to lay their head on the pillow at night. Kids, when you lay your head on the pillow at night, do you feel pretty good? I know you don't want to go to sleep all the time. I've got three kids myself, and they don't want to go to sleep. But they're usually excited. They want to read another story. Is that how you feel? But I hope you're not worried about something. <laughs> what was that answer? Uh, not me. Um, not me. All right, well, that sounds like my four-year-old. You and I are going to have a talk in a minute. <laughs> my talks don't work with her either. That's okay. But, but let me tell you, what he said was so true. I hope you're not worried about something. I hope you're not worried about something very serious. Kids, close your earmuffs for a minute. I hope you're not worried about being abused in some way because that's what a lot of these children face at home. School's not their worry. It's not their worry. So let me tell you very briefly, I need to wrap this thing up. We've got a lot of speakers. Let me tell you what we found very briefly. We found that in Kentucky, not only do we lock up more children than most, but we lock felons, misdemeanors, and those kids that miss school about the same amount of time, just one month difference in the length of stay. Write that down, because that should shock you. It shocked us. You know how much it costs to lock up a child in Kentucky? Eighty-seven to ninety-one thousand dollars. Now, for those of you that follow fiscal policy, wouldn't it be better to take that money and use it for community-based services to treat these children? Yes. Thank you. I thought someone would finally show some enthusiasm <laughs> for that. You have. But let me tell you, I could go on and on and on with things we've discovered in this two-year journey on our Juvenile Code Task Force to reform, to transcend, to transform juvenile justice in this state. But let me tell you something. I'm going to end by asking for your help. I don't think we can do it without your help. I don't think we can do it without your help. So I want you to reach out to those who are stakeholders, and shouldn't we all be stakeholders in this effort, but those who've been at the table negotiating this bill, which is being negotiated right now. I'm going to be coming to you through Kentucky Youth Advocates and others and asking you to help, to contact your legislators, contact the governor, Contact these stakeholders and let them know how important this effort is. 
So, will you help me? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Now, kids, here's your time to shine, kids, and all of you. I want you to say it with me. K-I-D-S. I want you to say it, kids. What is the most important issue facing us right now? On the count of three. One, two, three. Kids! Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'll turn it over. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you, sir. It really means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. At this point, I at this point, I would like to give special, recogni special recognition to, sit to Representative Wayne and Representative Western. Thank you. I will now introduce our key speakers for today. First, we have Ms. Jean Jacobs. She is, she is a grandmother from Northern Kentucky, raising her grandchildren. I have Ms. Adrienne Bush, Executive Director from Harvard Perry Community. Ministries. I have Ms. LaRosa Shelton, senior from Mail High School, and I have Keith Sanders Lawrence from the Educational Foundation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Governor Steve Brashear says he wants Kentucky to be a place where every person who needs a job has one where every child has an opportunity to be successful, and where every family enjoys financial security and a high quality of life. In order to make this happen, things need to change. My name is Jean Miller Jacobs. My husband and I have legal custody of three of my grandchildren, five, three, and two. Two of the children were born, born drug exposed and one was born drug addicted. My son was addicted to pain pill medication, and my daughter-in-law is a heroin addict who resides at the Campbell County Detention Center. The arrest happened on Monday. By Friday, I had a visit from the home caseworker. When she asked, when our worker asked if I could take all three children, my immediate response was yes. She said, can you provide for them? I said, of course. Both my husband and I worked, and we made a nice income. What I didn't know that morning was that my husband would lose his job that afternoon. And a year later, I would find myself having my job eliminated and in order to continue working, take a $20,000 a year pay cut. The way I describe the situation to people is this. If your house is on fire and your loved ones, whether it's your mother, an aunt, or your pet is in the house and you can go in and get them, you don't think about, come Monday, what am I going to do with those children? I have to go to work, or that I'm going to have to go to court five times in one week. How am I going to close three children? How am I going to feed them? One of them shows up in flip-flops and the clothes on their back. What are they going to sleep on? You go in with your superhuman strength, and you go and get them, and you worry about what's going to happen later. When I travel, when I take the kids to school, when I eat at Bob Evans. I meet people who have custody of children that are not theirs. I also meet people who could not take their family member's child because they could not financially afford to clothe the child or feed it. With drugs and mental illness, this is a growing problem in Kentucky, and the battles that we face are commonly unknown by other people. You would never remove an adult from everyone that they know and love, including friends, and put them with strangers. If you have ever grieved for the loss of a loved one, you know that it is not a short-term process. And yet we take children and put them in a home where the rules are different, the bed is different, the house smells different, and they may be separated from their siblings. There is a, play, there is a way to place children with grandparents and other family members who love them and know them, and want them, and want to take care of them. I know that one of my grandchildren are, is afraid of the dark. I know another one can't sleep without their blankie and their stuffed monkey. And I know another one likes to be held and read a story before they go to bed. 
Many relatives step in and take the children before they fully understand the financial setback ahead. And in my case, I didn't know that daycare for three children cost $1,625 a month. I didn't know how much it cost to clothe three children or feed them. Others with a broken heart and tears will say that they cannot take a child and live with that guilt and heartache every day. Restoring kinship care is a way to have the opportunity for that child and that family to be successful. Kinship care is cheaper than foster care. Families that give up jobs to take care of children because there is no other option is not a place where everyone who wants a job has one. Without a person working and contributing taxes to Kentucky, it hurts our economy and keeps us from moving forward as a state. Or worse, people who lose their job because that have taken in the children can no longer perform the, at the level that they used to, creating financial hardship or devastation because you have taken in your relative's child is not where every family enjoys financial security and a high quality of life. Please um, help make Kentucky a place where every child has the opportunity to be successful. When you meet with your legislators today and in the days ahead, ask them to build a budget that gives every child the best opportunity to thrive by helping children recover from trauma and support grandparents and relative caregivers in restoring funding for the kinship care program. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Adrian Bush. I am from Perry County, and I am a mother of a five-year-old. She just had her birthday. And I wish she were here with me today, but she is back at home at New Beginnings Learning Center. So this morning, I want to talk about the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP. This program allows children in households where parents are working to attend early childhood education or after-school programming <clears throat> for a reasonable cost to low-wage families. It allows private child care providers in poverty-stricken areas a way to educate children whose parents can least afford it. It is a program that, above all, works. Back in my home of Perry County, there is a mother, Allison, who was able to access early care and quality preschool education at our center, New Beginnings Learning Center, from the time her little boy Connor was a toddler like you all to this day where he is a first grader. Allison was a participant in the child care assistance program. She worked lower wage jobs while she worked her way to becoming a registered nurse. Once she graduated, she accepted a great job with financial security. Now she is able to pay market rates with no child care assistance necessary. None of that would have been possible without CCAP and access to private, full-day, year-round pre-K at our center. So the program worked until April of this year when Kentucky had to issue a freeze on new applications for people in lower-wage jobs. Then on July 1st, the income eligibility was lowered from 150% to 100% of the federal poverty line, the lowest in the entire country. What does this actually mean for Kentucky's families? In my home, it means that 90 children are estimated to lose or have lost child care assistance over the course of the moratorium, 15 of whom attended the two programs we operate. Those numbers do not include the children who have been turned away from quality early care and education because of the freeze on new applications. In the eight-county Kentucky River region, 170 children are estimated to lose their assistance. Statewide, an estimated 22,718 children have lost or will lose their assistance this year. How many adults have had to reduce their hours or quit their jobs altogether? I don't know. But in the distressed economy of eastern Kentucky and the overall Commonwealth, one job loss is too many. I'm here to tell you we can't afford that loss. As we rally today, our legislators are here for a long session. 
in part to adopt a two-year budget. This budget will be a public declaration of Kentucky's priorities. Do we prioritize our youngest children and close the achievement gap? I hope. I hope each of you will urge our General Assembly to change the course of the Child Care Assistance Program. We want to lift the freeze on new applications, reverse last year's budget cuts, and fully fund CCAP. and increase eligibility to 200% of the poverty line. <laughs> Our legislators want it, and communities across the state are showing support for it. For example, George Myers, 8th District Council Member for the Lexington Fayette Urban County Council, spearheaded the action on a resolution sent to the General Assembly asking for the governor and state legislators to restore at least some of the funding to the Child Care Assistance Program. <laughs> Councilman Myers is here with us today and should be recognized for his powerful, kid-focused stance. We have a real opportunity here to invest in our children and change the direction of our communities. And I think supporting early learning while enabling families to work is one of the best ways to do it. Thank you. I would first like to start off by recognizing Representative Krim and Senator McGarvey. We would like to thank you all for being with us this morning. Good morning. My name is LaRosa Shelton and I'm a senior at Louisville Mill High School. I am here today to talk about supporting a smoke-free Kentucky, a bill that would make our state healthier. This bill would ensure people have the right to breathe clean air in public places. Today, Louisville and Jefferson County already have a non-smoking court ordinance in place, and the, and the JCPS system implemented a non-smoking policy to ensure that all students have clean air to breathe. I feel public smoking is a public health issue because according to a 2011 Kentucky Youth Risk Behavior Survey, more than half of Kentucky high school students tried cigarette smoking. These numbers are too high for the future of Kentucky with cancer and heart disease on the rise. It is important for the children in all of Kentucky to be able to go to a public restaurant, sit down, enjoy their, and enjoy their meal without being exposed to secondhand smoke. It is sad when children are exposed to secondhand smoke. This can lead to having health concerns such as ear problems, respiratory problems, and severe asthma. During pregnancy, the risk factors are even worse. Spontaneous abortions, stillbirths, and sudden infant death syndrome after birth. Secondhand smoke is something that children and teens have to deal with when we go to public places, such as state and county fairs, parks, and in some, and in some, counties high, in some county high school football games. I am proud and thrilled, along with other families, to announce in Jefferson County, people cannot light up at a football game or school grounds. I want to share with you my experience. Louisville did not have an order ordinance for smoking when I was a young child. So growing up as a child, my family and I would go to our favorite restaurants or in our local community, and the one question they would ask was, smoking or non-smoking? What we did not realize then was that with us being sit, even with us sitting in the non-smoking section, we, were, we still were not protected from secondhand smoke. As a child, those chemicals were going into my body just by going to, just by going to a family-friendly restaurant. This is something that, fam that families in Kentucky are still having a problem with, and it needs to change now. The passing of this smoke-free Kentucky bill is, will not only make, make Kentucky a healthier place, but a place where we can all be united as a state. Please be supportive of the smoke-free legislation bill number HB 190 for the youth of Kentucky. We don't want to see our we don't want to see our our state go up in smoke. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Keith Sanders, and I'm with the Hager Educational Foundation in Owensboro. 
And today I am especially pleased to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of a state earned income credit that will help Kentucky's working low-income families achieve a base level of family financial self-sufficiency. Just like the federal earned income credit, which was enacted in 1975, this represents sound public policy. Here's why. This fully fundable federal earned income credit enjoys strong bipartisan support because it rewards work and effort. The federal earned income credit is our nation's most effective anti-poverty program. In 2011, it lifted the incomes of 6.1 million working low-income Americans over the poverty line. Today, we have 24 states in our country who have an enacted already an earned income credit to supplement the federal one. Kentucky should become one of those states. Here's why. Children growing up in financially self-sufficient homes are much more likely to be healthy, they're much more likely to succeed in school and become productive, well-adjusted adults. The earned income credit helps working low-income Kentuckians that are in the workforce stay in the workforce and it reinforces their efforts to become financially self-sufficient. Who will benefit? Who are the beneficiaries if our state General Assembly enacts an earned income credit in Kentucky? You'll find that those beneficiaries are Kentuckians who are caring for our aging parents in our nursing homes and working in our child care centers. They clean our offices and our hotel rooms. They drive our school buses and delivery trucks. And they prepare and serve our food when we eat out. All of these jobs and many others that pay minimal wages represent work which needs to be done. The enactment of a state earned income credit is an affirmation of the hard work these folks are doing trying to perform services which we need to help provide for their families. Today, I encourage all of you to communicate the need for a state earned income credit to your representative in the General Assembly. We will be better for it, and Kentucky's children will be the beneficiaries. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one final policy issue to talk to you about, and uh, again, then if you can just hang loose for just a second, we want to make sure we get the logistics down. I I'm not sure if there is an issue that we talk about that doesn't galvanize all of us more than, than child abuse. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit this afternoon around some legislative champions who, for instance, made possible that we have an external fatality review panel. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's a process that happens when it's too late. So the question is, how can we, about, how can we be about preventing child abuse, not simply uh, trying to figure out what went wrong? Uh, one of the most persistent and consistent champions around that issue is Representative Wooshner, who is here to talk to you about a proposal that she has on the table that we wanted to make sure you knew about uh, because it's a live and hopeful measure. Uh, representatives, thanks so much for your uh, leadership on this. Thank you. And thank you. It's just great to see all of you gathered here today, but especially you guys. I'm going to give you a statistic. You might not remember it. But long before I was elected to the General Assembly, I said this, and I have quoted it, and I'll say it over and over. You may be 25% of the population, but guess what? You're 100% of the future. And all the issues that we deal with and we work with are in our investment of our time and our energy and our commitment is for you. So I thank you for being here today, okay? 100% of the future. But briefly, and thank you, Terry, and thank you all you've gathered here today, 
I'm here with Representative Westrom, and again, we're bringing forth a piece of legislation, House Bill 157. It's a continuation of prevention and awareness and education and on the road to eradicating child abuse and neglect in Kentucky. In 2010, all of you helped and supported and put your energies behind House Bill 285. Well, now at the request of pediatricians for their practice, what we're calling this is one hour, only one time of continuing education in, the, in this area for pediat practicing pediatricians, emergency room physicians, family practice physicians, and radiologists so that we can continue to eradicate abuse and neglect here in the Commonwealth. With me today is also Dr. Kim Bowling, who is head of the Kentucky chapter of the American Academy of Pediatricians, and Dr. Melissa Curry. I think Dr. Bowling maybe just has a few more remarks. I just have a brief statement. Um, Abuse of head trauma is a completely preventable disease and is responsible for child deaths across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Its initial presentation may be very subtle and it's critical that healthcare providers are educated about these signs and symptoms. We know that doctors are not missing child abuse because they're bad physicians or uncaring. They simply don't have the information and the education. Recent professional educational endeavors have already shown significant results in the Commonwealth with the numbers of deaths and near deaths decreasing and allowing Kentucky to move out of the number one ranking nationally for deaths due to child abuse. The Kentucky chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics fully supports this bill and applauds legislators for their work to end abuse in Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. It's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Melissa Curry. Dr. Melissa Curry is the Medical Director and Chief of Children's Hospital Division on Pediatrics and Forensic Medicine. She's also Associate Professor at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. We have worked across the last few years on these issues, and so I just welcome her support and will like to listen to your remarks on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Representative Wushner and thank you to Representative Westrom for giving us this opportunity um, to help kids across the state of Kentucky. You know, as a physician, I remember very distinctly when I made the decision to become a doctor, one of the most important reasons was so that I could help people and so that I could, could most specifically help children. And I know that there is not a physician in the state of Kentucky who would want to go home at the end of a long day and know that they missed a case of child abuse. What the external child fatality review panel tells us, what years of experience and our, our data tracking in our program at the Cozair Charities Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine tells us is that we miss cases of child abuse. Our kids who are depending on us when they come in to see the doctor to pick up on those subtle clues that something is not right at home. They're coming in and leaving without it being picked up. And it's not, as Dr. Boland said, because we're bad doctors or because we don't care. It is simply because there is new information and new research out there that tells us what to look for that wasn't available when we had our training. And that is what this bill is about one hour, we have three years to complete it, one time to learn about these early warning signs so that we can protect these little guys who are depending on us. So I wanted to offer a call to action to my fellow physicians. I know that we have a lot of demands on our time and I know that folks ask us to do things that we don't always agree we have to do. But let's take this opportunity to show the country that the physicians in Kentucky care about kids. Thank you. Uh, representatives uh, Westrom and Wooshner uh, are going to be rejoining us uh, at that one o'clock event, so we'll talk a little bit more about this at that time. I also want to take just a moment and recognize Representative Montel, who has joined us, thanks for being here. Uh, all of you have thanked the speakers and what a great job they did, but I, I don't want to fail to recognize Rashawn, who I thought did a great job as a master of ceremonies. That's no small trick. 
So I, I get the uninspirational part, but I, again, I just want to remind you of a couple things. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for being here uh, today. If you have not registered, uh, we really need you to do that so that we can stay in touch with you during the session. That's up on the mezzanine. Uh, up there is also a uh, Children's Advocacy Day handbook that makes sure that you know what bills uh, are the priority, who to talk to. It has some advocacy tips. You also will find in there a schedule for events today. Uh, two things that I want to bring your attention to. At 11 o'clock in room 111, 11, 111, uh, is a series of symposia or mini seminars start about each of the blueprint issues. So if you want to learn more about the issues around kinship care and child care, if you want to learn more about youth justice, if you want to learn more about an earned income credit or a smoke-free law, uh, that's the place to be. Those are quick moving 15 minute sessions. We also have a, a really important partner that we're so happy to have here today. And that is that the uh, Black Alliance for Educational Opportunities uh, is here as a first time uh, presence at CAD. Uh, they will be hosting a, a, simul a similar kind of a seminar right here in the rotunda at 11 o'clock around the issue of charter schools. And uh, we all know that charter schools, there's a lot of information, a lot of misinformation, and that group wants to give you a chance to come and hear a little bit more about it. The final request, again, I think it's the third time we've mentioned it this morning, so we'll, we'll let it go after this, but we really do need this place packed at one o'clock. A lot of you have lots of issues that you wanna share with the governor. The governor is gonna be here at one o'clock today talking to you, so we're gonna look for you to come back. Again, thanks for making this a terrific beginning moment for the 10th Annual Children's Advocacy Day. Go get them.